Let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty and ever living Father, we approach your throne this morning. We have come to listen from you. May you speak to us. In Jesus' name, trust and pray. Amen. One last prayer. Praise the Lord. Amen. For those who are new to this church, my name is Geoffrey Utiambo. Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior of my life. And I want to confess that even this morning, I am saved. One or two months ago, I spoke about a dying church. And then, the week after, my brother Simon came with part two of the dying church. I didn't want us to leave it at that point. What else is required of a church? And therefore today, I want to speak about on this rock, I will build my church. On this rock, I will build my church. This was a statement by Jesus Christ himself to Peter. He had worked the whole day and he took time to rest with his disciples at Caesarea Philippi. And while they were climbing and resting, he asked them, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He went ahead to ask them, what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hate will not overcome it. And on this rock I shall build my church. This has been mis misinterpreted by many people. People have said, that Peter, after Jesus died, took the place of Jesus. And he was like in the position that he represented God and he was God himself. That is what people have believed. And that is the principle under which the Catholic also believed. Because Peter started the Catholic Church as the first pope. And so when the pope speaks ex, ex, ex cathedra, it is believed that whatever he says is the true message and the word of God. But here, it is very clear that when you read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, Peter, Ephesians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul says that the church was established on the teachings of the prophets and the apostles. The teaching of the prophets and the apostles. That is the basis under which the church was being built. And he goes ahead to say that and Christ being the chief cornerstone of that church. Christ being the chief Cornerstone. And therefore, it is not true that Peter took the position of Jesus Christ. Just by Jesus saying, on this rock, I shall build my church. But he is talking about something else that could be relevant to us. What he is saying here is that what Peter, because he had not introduced himself to these guys, they the disciples. They will see him do miracles. 
They will see him do a lot of other things that were amazing them. But they had not known who this person is. You remember when they were almost subsiding the boat and they woke Jesus and Jesus pulled the storm. And they said, they asked about themselves, who is this? Even the storms fear. Who is this? That means even themselves, they did not know who Jesus was because he had not introduced himself to them fully. And so when Peter answered, you are Christ, the son of the living God, Jesus replied, this was revealed to you by my father and not anyone else. That was a strong faith that Jesus never anticipated. And therefore, what he had means is that on that faith, that belief of Peter, that on, uh, on you are Christ, the son of the living God, that testimony that is going to build his church on the strength of the faith. No wonder, whenever he heals people, he will tell them, your faith has healed you. Not himself, but your faith has healed you. So it is on the basis of Peter's faith that the church was being built, and not on the person of Peter, but on the faith that Peter had prophesied or confessed on that day. I remember a few weeks ago I attended a service in uh, somewhere and it was a confirmation service that uh, of course the confirmation service is officiated by a bishop and a number of people were being baptized or confirmed or people I knew so after that I will talk to them and I ask them whether they are saved. And uh, they told me no. And I want us to look at page 59 of our prayer books, modern service prayer books. Page 59. I know many a times we have said these things without knowing what they are. I know many a times we have been taught these things and we take them for granted. But I want us to look at page 59, the making of promises. Here is a situation where we have come before God and the church. And we have our own mouths, item like that. And we have our own mouths, and from your own heart, you must declare your allegiance to Christ. And you are rejected of all that is evil. I therefore ask you these questions that Bishop asked us, and we make that promise in the church before God and the congregation. Do you turn to Christ? I turn to Christ. So all of us say that when we are confirmed. Do you repent of all your sins? I repent of them all. Do you renounce Satan, his works, and all the evil power of this, of this world? I renounce them all. Do you renounce the desires of your sinful nature and all forms of adultery? I renounce them all. I now call upon you to declare before God and this church that you are accept Christian faith into which you are baptized and which you live, grow, and serve. If that is not salvation, then I have not understood what salvation is. If on this day you are promised that you will reject the devil, and then five minutes after that somebody asks you whether you are saved, you are saying, I am not saved. You are also denying Jesus. Where are you? You are not on the side of the devil, you have just said, you are also not on the side of Christ. Where are you? This is the kind of faith that kills the church. Because it's a faith of hypocrisy. We confess on one hand and we don't on the other hand. We go to page 80, page 80, 08, page 80 of our prayer books. Do 
below there where it is written the minister. Part B. Sorry, sorry, page 78. Let's go to page 78 first. Item 21. Who then is supposed to take Holy Communion? Let us look at the last uh, paragraph. So all of you who repent of your sins, who love your neighbors, and intend to live a new life, following the way of Jesus, come with faith and take this holy sacrament. Those of you who intend to lead a new life, following the way of Jesus Christ, come with faith and take this holy sacrament. If then you don't love your neighbor and you don't intend to lead a new life, then it means you don't have faith and you have no business coming to the altar table to take the sacrament. We are people that have been taught and we are communicants. We take Holy Communion and we say this every day. And yet, when we are asked whether we are saved, we still deny the same faith you have confessed as you come to the altar table to take Holy Communion. Jesus is telling Peter, on this faith I shall build my church. On your faith, the church is going to be built. But if we have those kind of people with those kind of faith, then you cannot have a church. You cannot build a church. And here, it means, you know, the church has got many stones, and each stone has got its own place. Christ being the cornerstone, then Peter follows, probably other apostles, and then the rest of us, you have your space within the wall where the church is being built. But if you deny that faith, it means you don't have a space within that wall, and therefore you cannot help in building that wall. The wall cannot be built on a baseless faith, but on your faith, that is the church. It is on that faith that the church is prepared. And if that faith is as strong as the one Peter confessed, then the hate of gate will not have power over us. I remember a story that has been circulating around of a young man, 18 years, who stole a phone worth 55,000 and uh, got arrested. And uh, they also heard that the owner of the phone had been murdered. He was robbed and killed. And so the person who was found with the phone must have taken part in the robbery. And so the boy was arrested and charged with robbery, with violence. And we know the results of that is either death or life in prison. So the policemen told the parents as such when they went to see the young man and they were terrified because this was their only son. And then the police told them, the only way out is to give us half a million so that we help you out and get your son back. These parents being poor as they were, sold everything that they could lay their hands on, raised money from a quarter, quarter and they could got loan, raised the money, took it to the police, the son was released. They went to the sun home, and in that pay of how they will pay the money, and how they have sold everything they had within the family to raise that money, for a small mistake that the boy had done, they warned the boy and told them, if you do such a thing again, we will never come to your rescue. You have seen what you have done to this family, now we are back to where we were coming from. We are now paupers. And then the boy told their parents, don't worry, 
when I was being released, I saw where this policeman kept the money, and I took it. Here it is. I wonder what your reaction will be as a parent and a Christian in that scenario. Will you give yourself back to the police? Do you give your son back to the police? Do you return with the money? Or do you keep it? This is the kind of dilemma that we face every day as Christians. As we walk in this faith. And remember, it is your faith that will help you overcome the hells of Gentry. I wonder whether we'll be able to overcome the hell of Gentry at that point. One of the characters that made Peter was that he knew Christ. He knew who Christ was. And he confessed it, that you are Christ, the son of the living God. <coughs> and because he knew Christ, and Jesus knew his faith, he said, on you I shall build my church. And you see Peter showing that faith after Christ has, has, has died, and he has been left. Initially they feared, they thought, these people who kill our Lord will also kill us. But Peter bravely came out and preached during the Pentecost, and 3,000 plus were saved. 3,000 plus. Without fear that I will be killed like my Lord. And he will still roam around preaching the word of God. At one point, he was arrested for the gospel. But he said, I'm not going to give up. I'll show you all. And he kept preaching the word of God wherever he went. And of course, when he was arrested, we remember, the other disciples prayed, prayed, and he was released. But he never went on with the faith. And it's on that basis of the, the, the sufferings and the persecutions that the disciples went through out of their faith that the church was built and the word spread all over the world on the basis of the faith of the disciples and out of the persecution and people were seeing how they were fearless in the persecution. And then it reminds me of a story of this man called Nansen. He was an Indian from um, Northeast India. There was a time in Europe, Wales, when there was a revival. And because of that revival, people were going out and were ready to buy to die for Christ and would go out to preach the word of God. And so some family went as far as Northeast India to preach the gospel in a missionary work. While there, they met a community that were very fierce there were people who would give no a damn, they would kill for whatever reason. They were feared the community. And that community was called Assam. They never liked Christianity because it was watering down their faith. And so whoever preached the word was killed. And so there was a family that got converted during that mission work. And uh, when they got back converted, this gentleman with his family, they were baptized and they started preaching the word. The king was very fierce. He was very annoyed with what this guy was doing because this is what we want to kill. And the guy is going around preaching the gospel against our will. So he called a huge baraza and he called that family forward. And he told the man, you denounce Christ or I kill your two children. And the guy wrote, I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. 
and then the two children were killed. Then they told him, they announced Christ or we kill your wife. The guy said, even though no one will go with me, I still will follow Christ. The wife was killed. He was told, he announced Christ or you give up your life. You have seen what has happened to your child and your wife. You are the only one left. He said, the cross before me, the wild behind me, I will not be announced my Lord. He was shot dead. And this thing pained the king. And he wondered, what kind of a faith is this? How could somebody accept to die with his family because of a man who died so many kilometers away from our home? What is it? When he searched, he also got converted. And he confessed that Christ. When he confessed that Christ, the whole community came and followed him and confessed the Christ because of the faith of this family. That is the faith that built a church. Faith requires us to be strong men. The faith, like the one Peter confessed, requires us to be strong men. Because if you are not strong, then you can easily give up. Peter was so strong, he accepted that whatever comes, he will face it out head on. So long as he will not separate him from the love of God and Jesus Christ. And that is what is required of us. Sometimes we face a lot of challenges in our walk of faith that sometimes we don't know how to do or manage it or deal with it. And so, because we want to please man and ourselves, and because we want to live, live a easy life, we give those things up because we are not strong enough to stand by them. Those principles of Christianity. The faith that builds a church requires a strong man. I also remember a story of a lady who won a lot of money, 100 million, a money that she had never seen in her life and she, never, she doesn't expect to see in her life. She took this man home in a bag, told the husband, and they started planning with that money. That night, robbers came into the family, tossing a gun and telling them, you have two choices as a family. The husband seated there and the wife on this side. Choose between the two. We either rape the lady and leave the money, or we take the money and we leave you people home. I'm not sure the kind of decision the man will make, given that this is money he cannot get in his entire life. And now the money is with them. Whether he can be able to give up his wife for rape, or the lady accepting to be raped so that they keep the 100 million, which they have never seen and they don't expect to see in their life. Peter faced several of such scenarios. Peter was a businessman. And now he's been asked to leave his business. That was generating money for him and helping him to support his family and to live a good life. To start roaming the villages and streets where he is getting nothing in the name of somebody called Jesus Christ. But out of faith, he left them. He left that good life where he would go do his business, come back to his house, eat good food, and sleep in a nice bed and in a nice house to follow Christ where he's not sure of a meal. He's not sure whether he will take a shower. He's not sure where he's going to sleep. He gave that up and he said, I will follow you. And that's the kind of thing 
that the church was there. That you become a society reject because you have rejected their cultural norms, like Peter did. The Jews are a culture that people wanted to follow. And many a times we find Peter also like us getting himself tied down in some of this culture and was unable to make decision. And the court and then Paul came up to rebuke him. Sometimes we are called as Christians, also not sometimes, in many times, that in situations where Christianity conflicts our culture, then Christianity carries the day. Are we able to withstand that? Sometimes we have witchcraft. You know, people have gone to, to practice this thing for their benefit because somebody has interested you. If you want your business to grow, if you want these people who are bothering you to go, if you want your child to be well and whole again, visit these guys. If you want to succeed at your places of work or whichever place, Visit these guys, and sometimes they look so pretty, and they promise a lot of hope, but would like, are we able to compromise them with our faith? <coughs> Not forgetting the issues of bribery that is so rampant in our society. Are we able to compromise them with Christ? This requires a strong man who is able to stand his ground, the ground of his faith. Because if you are weak, you will not be able to withstand the hate, the gates of hate. It will sweep you. And Paul, Peter, overcame because he was strong and he stood for his faith. The third thing, humbleness. I like the humbleness of Peter. When people are in authority, you can never question, and it goes for free. When people are in authority, Paul was a man in authority, and in authority to an extent that God had given him power. You remember there was a day he was going to a church, a temple, and then he met this crippled guy at the gate who was begging for money, and then he looked at him and he said, I have no money. But one thing I have which I'm going to give you, stand and walk. And the guy stood and walked. And people who saw him said, this must be God. He cannot be anybody else. This guy was born uh, crippled. How can he walk? How can he be made to walk within a second? This must be a God. And people started worshipping him. They went there glorifying him. And he said, no. Don't do that, I'm not God. He who sent me did it, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have seen that many a times this tradition. Sometimes when you preach and so many people get converted, when you pray and people get healed, you want people to recognize that you did it. And then, uh, you see, people, people even advertise themselves with that. Huh? You have seen posters where somebody has thrown, he, he, he's taken a picture of himself of people who are getting healed. He's taking all the glory. Peter was such a humble man. He will not take the glory. He gave the glory back to whoever wants it. Jesus Christ. And it is not only in that area, one time, Peter went to dine with the Gentile, and he was sitting with them, he was unhappy. And Paul and Barnabas somehow found out. And when they went and they saw Paul and Barnabas come, Peter disowned those people, and he said, no, you must be circumcised, <laughs> otherwise I will not eat with you. But you have been eating with them a few minutes ago. That is the kind of hypocrisy sometimes we get ourselves into. And, you know, 
Paul rebuked him. And he told him, Peter, you should not be a hypocrite. Stand firm. And he accepted. If you read the book of Galatians, chapter 2 from verse 13, Peter accepted the rebuke. If we should not have accepted, after all, Paul is uh, a Johnny come late in this ministry. He has been there from the beginning. And he's the stone on which the church has been built. Who is you to tell him what to do? How can you rebuke him? But he accepted the rebuke. That is the humbleness of Peter. And he goes ahead when he writes his first and second Peter. And he says, there are things that Paul explained that are beyond my understanding. Beyond. Yet he was there at the beginning. And he is recognizing the wisdom and the knowledge of Paul. That Paul has said a lot of things that are beyond my understanding and knowledge. I cannot even comprehend. That is a sign of humbleness. Accepting that your journeys are better than you. We cannot build a church when we lack humbleness. When we are constructing a church like this one, we want all the glory. When we are doing the work of God, we want all the glory. We cannot build the church in that kind of humbleness. Church will be built in the humbleness. The humbleness helps us to accommodate everyone. Those who have, those who don't have, the sick, the weak, the rich, the poor, the fed, the unfed, the angry, those who have no faith and those who have faith. Humbleness brings you together. I remember when we were in college, there was a very fierce guy who belonged to Focus. He was a Focus coordinator. And uh, he was saying, he was telling us one time in our Christian fellowship that as Christians, you must stand for ground. You should not allow people to push you around because you are a Christian. That when they smoke and then they puff it on you, hit them. <laughs> hit them. So, and we as Christians and young people, you know, you want to prove that you are fighting for Christ. And we will do that. And there was a lot of violence, people, Christians and not Christians fighting. That does not build the church of God. I tell you, my brothers and sisters. The building of the church of God is out of humbleness, which is accommodating that we are able to fit in whichever ring that we are. Just the same way we all come here to kneel as we take Holy Communion. In the same level, taking the same things making us all equal, that kind of happiness should be reflected in our daily walk with Christ. And that is what built the church. They say, don't look for glory because of the things you have done. Peter succeeded because of that. And because of love for his name, his neighbors. Love of his neighbors. You remember he mobilized the apostles to sell whatever they had and share whatever they had they got. So that they may be at an equal level. I'm not saying that we also need to do that. But I'm just bringing you a scenario where Paul mobilized people to help their neighbors showing love to one another. And again, he also did that when he heard that there was anger in Jerusalem. He mobilized funds. He fundraised. And there was enough food to feed the people in Jerusalem. You remember the Macedonia church giving according to their capacity and even beyond. Out of the understanding and the faith that was preached to them by Paul and Peter. Love for one another makes you get concerned 
when we have issues with our neighbors and sometimes there are things we can help sort out. When we love our neighbor and do good to them, then this world will be a small heaven. Like we pray, may your kingdom come. We will make that God's kingdom come here if we care for one another. I remember the East Africa Revival. Majority of you may not be aware of them. But this was a movement of Christians in East Africa to turn around the community into Christianity, to live their whole life into a new life. It was a movement that was started in Uganda, Rwanda, and came, flew all over East Africa. A number of our parents were members of this, and these people had the faith understand. You remember during the uptaking, they risked majority of them who came from this area, risked their life. And um, in our place, I can also tell you many scenarios where these people risked their life. And on that basis, the church grew. Many people who were against protecting or against some of the things that were happening in their community joined that movement and accepted Christianity on the basis that they did not like what was happening and they needed to live a new life. And that is how the gospel was spread in our communities. On those basis of these people risking their life, sacrificing all that they had for their neighbors and even for themselves that made Christianity grow in this part of the world. Love for one another made Peter hit with the Gentiles. Even though he knew the Jews were against it. But he didn't know how then do I win these guys to Christ. He did not know. So when Peter came and raised these matters with him and Barnabas, he ran away. But Peter told him, do it. Because this is our calling. We are called to reach the whole world. The love of one another made Peter did things that were thinkable among the Jews at that time. The love of one another made Peter, like I mentioned, heal the sick. And the love of one another made Peter to accept to die for Christ. You remember when he was now being crucified? He said, don't crucify me like my, my Lord. Crucify me upside down because he wanted people to go to heaven and he accepted to die so that these people may go to heaven and know this Jesus Christ. The church is being built on these characters that God. We need to be the true stone that will help build the church. We need to look at our faith and ask ourselves, can the church be built on my faith? Can I be that rock that Jesus will say, on you I shall build my church? Can Jesus look at you? Are you one who is a hypocrite? Comes to say that you love your neighbor and intend to live a new, a new life. In the presence of God and the congregation, take Holy Communion, go back and reject the same God. Can our faith be reliable? Can our faith win our neighbors to Christ? In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.